that take it now. So the tax credit, with the portion of your tax credit that you're going to get for the feds, that would be sent to the health insurance company. So you would pay us less amount each month. Or you could take it later, which means that you would pay the full amount of your premium, and then you'd get the tax credit when you file your taxes. That's how this whole thing is you know, reconciled. Or you could split it. You could take a little bit each month to help reduce your, cost, your premium amount each month at the time that you're actually paying the bill, and then get a little bit when you, get your, when you file your taxes and get your tax refund. On the next slide, you can see a, a very basic high-level example of the concept of this tax credit. So these are estimates for an individual, and then we'll look at a family of four. So again, we said this is based on some factors such as L, uh, income for your eligibility for the tax credit. Let's look at the Erie County example. Uh, the adult, an individual, earning $20,000. And I show you this slide with all these numbers, but please know that you don't have to calculate this. The marketplace system will calculate it for you, whether you enroll online, over the phone, or in person. The marketplace will tell you in this example, the tax credit for that person is $190 per month. Premiums for that person would start at $85. So the idea is your tax credit reduces the amount of your premium. If you want to purchase a plan that's more expensive than your tax credit, of course, you make up the balance. Another important thing to say about the tax credit for the premiums is that it's uh, the way that Congress set it up in the Affordable Care Act, it's tied to the second lowest cost silver plan. Um, I won't get into the fancy calculation because it's kind of in the weeds and complicated, but the point is, because they set it up that way, as the cost of health insurance increases, the tax credit is also scheduled to increase. So that's a good thing. If we go to the next slide, we'll look at our family of four example. In this family of four, we're going to assume there's a family earning $50,000 a year. This example assumes that two adults um, are going to purchase a private plan through the marketplace, and two kids are going to be eligible for Child Health Plus. Remember, we talked about the marketplace can enroll people in Medicaid and Child Health Plus, as well as private plans. So in this example, it turns out the family is eligible for a tax credit of $270 a month. The premiums for the whole household would add up to starting at $299 a month. That breaks down to uh, about $280 for the adults after the tax credit and then the $18 for the kids. Uh, the tax credit is only able to be applied towards those private plans. As I said, um, if someone is eligible for a public program like Medicaid or Medicare, uh, they are not eligible for those tax credits. The way that the federal government set it up, because if you're eligible for Medicare or Medicaid, then your subsidized um, health insurance from the government comes from those programs. On the next slide, we can talk about how the individuals and families will pay their premiums. Um, we talked about how the small business marketplace will send a monthly bill to the small employer. That's not the way it's going to work the individual marketplace. In this uh, individual marketplace, the enrollees would actually pay the plans directly. So they would enroll through the marketplace, but then their uh, you know, confirmation work after they pick the plan through the marketplace, they would be dealing with the plan as their you know, private plan coverage that includes paying the premiums. So the premium payment can be accepted in a variety of means. This includes paper checks, cashier's checks, money orders, electronic funds transfer, and your all general purpose prepaid debit cards. And finally, let's talk about our ad campaign. So as I mentioned, October 1st is when we officially launch, and you will of course see a big ad campaign, media campaign, to help tell the general public that we exist, because there are a lot of people who couldn't join us here today. We wanna to make sure they know what's going on. Um, on our next slide, as I mentioned earlier, on August 20th, we announced our branded name, New York State of Health, the official health plan marketplace. We announced our logo that you've seen in all the slides so far. And we also unveiled our new website. So I mentioned earlier, we previously were called The Exchange, so we had a website address that included that. Now our new website address is nystateofhealth.ny.gov. Um, part of our media campaign, well, it's an extensive media campaign, the parts that will be included. Uh, include TV, radio, print, and you're out of home, things like billboards or you know, signs on buses. Uh, we also have a public relations campaign underway. Uh, this includes some enrollment summits that are being organized by our stakeholder partners. The idea is to bring a lot of groups together and uh, you know, give an update, have staff like me be there to help give an update so people understand the recent changes, including this name announcement, uh, but really give the different stakeholder groups in the communities across the state a way to get together and plan how they're going to effectively get out the word. 
So the one in Buffalo is actually happening this Monday, uh, September 16th from 1 to 4. It's going to be held at the 1199 SCIU office on Main Street in Buffalo. Uh, we'll also, of course, have our social media accounts that you see listed here. Uh, social media, of course, is very important these days to help get the word out. So you'll see on here, under our first bullet, that we have a link to a video. This, you haven't seen it on TV just yet, but what this is, we call it our mantra video. It really sets the tone for explaining where that New York State of Health name came from. And with the help of our IT professionals, we can show you the video right now. That's our mantra video. I'm a big fan. Um, on the next slide, we can see our strategic message. And this is very similar to what you just heard in the video that really summarizes where the name came from and what the whole point of it is. Uh, you'll also see the strategic message. This is basically the centerpiece of what the campaign will encompass. So as you can see here, here's our message. The New York State of Health is an online marketplace offering New Yorkers a gateway to affordable health care. Comparing and finding the right plan for you and your family has never been easier. We've removed the hassle. You can choose from a certified group of health insurance plans, giving you the peace of mind that you are prepared for life's events. Uh, on our next slide, I referenced that we recently had that new URL when we announced our name, the nystateofhealth.ny.org, excuse me, .ny.gov. This is the homepage for our website, and there are two things I want to point out to you right now. I mentioned that we have those social media accounts that have uh, been kicked off and will really be a key factor in getting our word out, the message out, especially on October 1st so people can start using the marketplace. You'll see the different uh, accounts linked within the lower right side of your homepage screen. As you can see, we'll have Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, as well as an RSS feed. And then the other piece I wanted to show you is the lower left side of the screen. There's a little box that says stay informed with your email address. That, of course, means that you can sign up for email updates through our uh, website if you're interested in getting more information, uh, especially as we approach October 1st. And on the last slide, you'll see that website address that I've referenced a few times. Again, we're nystateofhealth.ny.gov. This is, if you go there today, it's a bunch of information about what's coming. But starting October 1st, that's the address you need to remember to be able to use the marketplace uh, to enroll in health insurance. As well, also find other information like the call center phone number. When that's available, it will be posted here as well. And also the site schedules and locations for the different people who can help you apply in person. And again, we launch October 1st. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Melody. And thank you all for gathering this evening. This is the right place to be. 47 years ago, a leader whose presence on the planet we just celebrated a few days or a few couple of weeks ago said that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and most inhumane. But today we stand at a point to where we can change that. And many of us in this room probably bear witness to how difficult it was to not be able to get insurance, to not be able to afford insurance. 
All of us in the room should have seen the data that exists that talks about the communities that have been disparaged in health care service. So we are indeed at a right point and a necessary point. But in order for us to prevail and, and take and lead us forward so that everybody is happy, so that it's good for all, it's going to take cooperative, collective, responsible work of all of us. And that's one of the reasons why the insight, or I should say the foresight, of Council President Richard Fontana and Majority Leader Damone Smith to host this evening is so important and so necessary. Now, there'll be many more, but as when I was a kid, they used to say the early bird catches the worm. It's good that you're here early at one of the first sessions in Buffalo that is going to be dealing with this issue of affordable health care. I'd like to reintroduce our panelists, and I'd like them either to either wave the hand or stand so people really know who's in the room, because these are the experts that are going to respond to some of the questions that I hope you have already written down. And if you haven't written down, you can start writing them now. I also want you to know in the housekeeping, as you go out the door, immediately to your right are the ladies' room, and for the men, you step four or five steps further directly in the hall, and on your left is the men's room. Uh, it was mentioned that we are live streaming. It'll be shown repetitively over Channel 2 in the days and weeks to come. And having said that, oh, one other thing. I, I'm a stickler about uh, accountability. Accountability really starts when you sign in. So if you didn't sign in legibly so that we can but send you some further information or contact you, uh, you might, before you go out, want to make sure you get a good email or contact information down there. We do have hard copies of the PowerPoint that we'll be willing to make available. Won't be ready tonight, but if you get the contact information out there, you can get it. So let me introduce the panelists, and I'll start with Pamela Pawinski, who is the Vice President of Sales for Univera Healthcare. We have Roberta Riken, Rifkin, who is the Vice President of Government Affairs for Independent Health. Don Ingalls, Vice President, State and Federal Reg Relations for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York. Simone Washington, MSBA Manager and uh, Financial Counseling Department, Kaleida Health. And our presentation that was just presented was by Melanie Stange, who is the External Affairs Outreach and Marketing Project Coordinator for, you saw it on your paper, New York State of Health, also known by a couple other names, uh, Healthcare Exchange, and she's got a few other names she could share with you about what this action has been called. But nevertheless, our job here today is to really hear your questions. And as, oh, right on time, thank you. Okay, uh, you can continue writing um, and we'll, we'll deal with them. Okay, okay. I, I won't read the name, I'll just say, in regards to, to, to the panelists, who, whosoever will. In regards to employer only being required to supply the insurance to employees working 40 or more hours, is there a provision to avoid employers from cutting the hours of existing employees? For well, employees who, yes, ah, on the spot. And your microphones work, by the way. Yeah, they do. Um, the question is about the responsibility of what level of employees, employers are, are responsible for Providing coverage under the law, and uh, is there any is there any prohibition from companies from for cutting hours? Um, the the law says that uh, that employers over 50 full-time equivalent employees uh, have to provide coverage, or if they don't, they have to pay a penalty in, in lieu of providing coverage. 
Uh, now, the penalty for not providing coverage, if you're a company over 50 full-time equivalents, uh, has been delayed. So there will be no penalty for companies that don't provide uh, coverage uh, in 2014. But then in 2015, uh, there will be that penalty, assuming that it, it goes into effect then, as it's slated to now. And the, the question really was, um, the, the requirement then, if, if, you're in that, if you're in that size company, the larger companies, uh, you have the obligation to provide coverage to your full-time workers and their dependents. And full-time under the law is defined as 30 hours a week or more. So some companies, as the question sort of uh, suggests, some companies now provide coverage to people working 40 hours or 37 and a half hours. Uh, under, the, under this provision, they will have to offer coverage to people working 30 hours a week or more. So there have been reports in the paper that some companies are uh, reducing the hours of employees, uh, to, uh, especially more part-time employees, down to no more than 29 to try to escape that. Now, we don't know how, many, how, how widespread that will be, but there have been some reports of companies doing that. And at this point, uh, maybe Roberta knows or Pam if there are uh, provisions that, that stop that, but I, my sense is not at the moment. Uh, people, uh, you know, employers are free to set the level of um, hours needed to work to get coverage. Yeah, there, there is, I'm not aware of any provision to stop that, but there is legislation to um, review that requirement, and there's a lot of um, interest in Congress um, to maybe up that from 30 hours to 40 hours, so it's going the other way. Um, the other thing, I, Don mentioned that um, employers have responsibility to provide coverage to their employees and their dependents. And I just want to make it clear that the Affordable Care Act and the regulations around that clarify that dependence does not include spouse. So an employer's responsibility to provide coverage to employees and their dependents is really to the employee and their children up to age 26. It doesn't mean that employers will stop doing that. It just means that the responsibility is to provide coverage for the employee and the dependent, not necessarily the spouse. Okay, question number two. Do I have to enroll in some kind of credit? And if so, is there a credit type for those whose income is so low? I think the question is um, for individuals. So there is also the individual requirement that uh, most everybody have health insurance starting in 2014. That's been called the individual mandate. There are some exceptions, but the law expects, uh, you know, suggests that most people uh, will have to have coverage either through their employer or through Medicaid or Child Health Plus or Medicare or their employer coverage or that they will be eligible, that they will buy it on the exchange. Now, for people who uh, have incomes below 400% of the poverty level, and for a family of four, that's about $97,000, I think, um, starting in 2014. So they will be eligible for a federal um, tax subsidy, uh, some uh, so payment by the federal government to help you afford coverage. The lower the income uh, that you have, uh, the more, the, the greater the amount of the subsidy. It sort of trails off as you get close to 400%. Um, and then there are some other supports too for people with coverage just above the Medicaid level up to 250%. There's some other cost sharing uh, support okay. too. So we, we encourage people to apply on the exchange, and as Melanie pointed out, the, um, the exchange will, uh, you put in your information, and it will come back and tell you if you qualify for a subsidy and how much. Oh, no, 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 no verbal. 
Uh, th those, are, those were the, the we're gotten by. Uh, yeah, but we're gonna we're gonna come to that right now. I promise you that. I I hate to be so strict, but that's what we want to do is have you please put it down. I know some things may not get answered right away. Well, we'll get it. Somebody's writing it down. We got it down here too. Um. um <laughs> Oh, anyway, let me just add on to, and it may be part of what you just asked, Sam. Um, the, person, the, the question I asked about the income being so low uh, to the point of where they don't pay taxes because they, they can't file taxes, um, it's basically people who have no income, uh, people are wondering what's the threshold for them to kind of get in there. Is there a threshold? Can you explain who all is eligible? Everybody is eligible, but can you make it a little clearer? If you're on social services, if you if you're receiving any kind of benefits, how does that impact it? So, if you don't have income at this point, you would be eligible for Medicaid, and Medicaid coverage is not does not cost you anything. So you can have no income. You can have some income, or you can have more income. And at each level, there's a recognition that at no income, there's no way you can afford coverage. But there is Medicaid coverage available to you. And if you go, so think of that exchange, the New York State of Health, as one door. You open it up and you say, here I am, and here's my income. They're gonna tell you to go down this path, the Medicaid path, where you will have choices of which kind of Medicaid plans to choose from. If you knock on that door and open it up and put in, I make $20,000 a year, they will tell you to go down this hallway and be eligible for subsidies. So the point of it is, no matter what your income level is, even if you make a million dollars a year, you can still go into this exchange and get coverage, okay? It is not just for people with lower income. It is for, it is for all people to access coverage. The, additionally, the, with the employers. Now, uh, there's fear that, as you saw from the one question, that the employers may try and duck and hide, you know, avoid paying it. Uh, will you speak to that? Will they be able to? And will you also speak to the fact that there is a delay on the part of the employer and what that means? Uh, part of the regulation initially was to implement fines or fees or taxes for employers who, are, who have uh, over 50 employees in their workforce who try to avoid offering health insurance. That is one element of the regulation that's been postponed at this point to 2015. That was supposed to be in effect as of January of 2014. Um, many employers, and certainly many large employers, many small employers, do currently offer health insurance to their employees as a way to recruit and att attract and retain uh, a competent and, and effective workforce. And we frankly hope and expect that many of those employers will continue to offer health insurance to their workforce for those same reasons. Um, we are not seeing in the groups in, that we offer health insurance through or sell health insurance to many employers trying to retract just because of this regulation, start to retrench from those obligations that they willingly took on before the impact of health care reform came into, into play. Should the exemption that's been given to employers worry people? Um, where um, Roberta spoke about it earlier, um, where if the the employers, because of the situation with IRS having to be able to regulate or figure out how much money uh, is being paid. For. So what's what's going to happen is that I think um, what I was talking about. We were at a presentation earlier on this. Hi, Brian. Um, and. It, the point is that employers will have new calculations to make based on the different obligations that are put forth in this new Affordable Care Act. So will people. 
there's an interesting situation where um, some people might, the employer offers coverage and their family coverage might be $300 a month where the single coverage is $100 a month. And they might, the spouse might say, you know what? If I get coverage on the exchange, it will be cheaper. So you get your coverage from your employer, I'll get my coverage on the exchange, and oh, by the way, I'll also get my child's coverage on the exchange as well. So there's a different dynamic. I guess the biggest message here is that there'll be a lot of new choices for individuals. There'll be a lot of new options for employers. We don't, options ranging from offering coverage for the first time to their employees to actually dropping coverage to, to, to employees they already provided coverage to. So I think everything's up for grabs now and understanding what those options are is, is what I think we're trying to do here. Um, by the way, I'm not gonna filter anyone's questions, so as you write it, I'll, I'll read it and um, we'll fill in the blanks where they may need to be if, if, if that happens. Next question is, as a full-time intern employee, how would you get health insurance? What kind of employee? Full-time intern. Full-time. A full-time intern employee, how would you get health insurance? So interns evidently don't get covered, or, I mean, I think on the job. Well, if the organization doesn't offer it, then you would just, you know, go through the marketplace and apply on your own. Um, as Roberta was saying, it's for everyone, um, no matter how low your income is or, you know, it does matter how high your income is, but then you can purchase it on your own. But the market um, is open to everyone. And what I'm, what I'm finding is that um, many people who have wanted health insurance, who have been unable to afford health insurance, they're really excited about it. And they just want to understand, you know, what the cost is going to be. That's the big question. But as she said, there's going to be something for everyone. And, and just to add on what they were talking about with the employers, um, we have received already several calls from small businesses in Buffalo. They are really excited and wanting to learn about what's available to them and what's available to their company. I have right now um, several appointments set up for after October 1st for small businesses, some downtown, some out in the um, suburbs. And they're really excited because, as um, she mentioned earlier, this is a way to say we can offer insurance to our employees um, and it can help you, um, as mentioned earlier, retract, um, attract and retain people because they do have insurance. You don't have to worry about them possibly jumping ship because another company is offering it. So it's going to be a, um, um, a very uh, beneficial thing for everybody. So anyone that's interested, um, as she said, whether or not you qualify for Medicaid or one of the um, metal levels, there's something for everyone in the exchange. So can you, for the small businesses in here, they, it, they can also get help? And yes, of course. Um, we've, we've had a couple of calls and, you know, they said, can you come and tell me about it now? And I've had to say, well, you know, we're not fully ready, you know, as of now, but October 1st, we can have someone come out and meet with you. We can bring education. And um, there's assistance available with the in-person assisters to assist individuals and businesses. Right. And to help not only in uh, getting that done, but also money, uh, credit. Uh... So the Small Business Health Care Tax Credit that the yes. Affordable Care Act creates, yep. it's currently available today to small businesses who meet the eligibility criteria that was on that slide. Starting in 2014, Congress said that that tax credit will only be available to small businesses who purchase coverage through the marketplace. So you must purchase your coverage through the health exchange. Yes. And it was mentioned earlier also that for, there are some who, uh, some of the clinics they go to, they pay, they pay themselves. So they can buy direct. Now, they wouldn't be covered by the health exchange, correctly? So are you talking about something like a self-employed or a yeah, sole uh, provider? Or individual? Yeah. yeah, so they would, will absolutely be able to purchase through the marketplace. The federal rules say that sole proprietors or the self-employed, they're counted as individuals. So they wouldn't be eligible for the small business health care tax credit. They'd be eligible for the individual uh, tax credit based on premium and if they meet the other eligibility criteria. But yes, as has been said by the other panelists, absolutely the marketplace is for everybody. Come on in, check it out, and see what's available to you. 
Can you go to the health exchange if your even if your employer offers an insurance plan? Well, that's a little complicated. Uh, generally, no. If you're offered health insurance coverage through your employer and it it's affordable under the way the law defines affordability, then um, you're you're not eligible to go to this exchange and get a subsidy. You could go to the exchange.